Grero, the masculine gender and cure for heterosexuality, or did you know you're not straight? Once upon a time, there was a world where the love between men wasn't merely tolerated, but understood as an attribute and requirement of masculinity. Their philosophers debated just how much better was the love between men. In their epics that codify their sacred virtues, their mythical heroes loved one another just as often as their gods took mortal men as boyfriends. As lovers, male couples slay tyrants at home and vanquish enemies abroad. In politics, almost all of their emperors loved men. But this is not a fairy tale. Such was the documented history of the Greco-Roman world spanning a millennium. What changed and how? Chapter 1, The Sexual Flexibility Among Greco-Roman Males Homer's recounting of the bloody Trojan War and the Iliad and Odyssey illustrates the real-life military culture based on permanent warfare in which masculinity was highly valued. Given our current prejudices, it is then shocking to discover that one of the most celebrated military units, the Sacred Band of Thebes, was compromised entirely of male lovers. Plutarch tells us the reason for such an arrangement. Quote, for when the going gets tough, tribesmen don't give much thought for their fellow tribesmen, nor clansmen for their fellow clansmen. But a battalion joined together by erotic love cannot be destroyed or broken. Its members stand firm beside one another in times of danger, lovers and beloveds alike motivated by a sense of shame in the presence of the other. After half a century of victories, the sacred, uh, the sacred band was finally defeated by Philip II of Macedon, who wept at the thought of such noble pairs dying. As he had many male lovers himself, Philip's remorse is easy to understand. His son Alexander the Great in turn grieved uncontrollably at the loss of his dearest friend, Hephaestion, by flinging himself on the body of his friend and lay there for nearly all day long in tears and refused to be parted from him until he was dragged away by force by his companions. A heartbroken Alexander died a few months later. There was no shame in those days about open male male love secluded. The real-life warrior couple Harmodius and Aristeheton was honored in poems for assassinating the tyrant Hipparchus is it any wonder that the tyrannical regimes always have had suspicions of same-sex relationships and sought to outlaw them? These mortals merely imitated the king of their god Zeus, who as an eagle in one account, carried his lover Ganymede back to Mount Olympus. Homer confirms, quote, Tros, king of Trojans, had three noble sons, Ilus, Asarachus, and Ganymede, who was the comeliest of mortal men, wherefore the gods carried him off to be Zeus's cupbearer for his beauty's sake that he might dwell among the immortals." End quote. The inclusion of such an unmistakable same-sex relationship verified by numerous graphic plates in perhaps the most well-known literature from the era boggles the mind, but only if we let our current culture convince us that the love between men cannot be masculine and belongs to a certain stereotypically weak-jointed minority. The Ganymede myth is merely a reflection of a wider custom. To be masculine and reach full adulthood, a Cretan adolescent needed a sexual relationship with another male, the fake abductor in a prearranged mock kidnapping who prized the youth not for his handsomeness but his manliness. If the younger abductor's friends determined that the abductor was of equal or superior rank and suitably masculine character, they would cheerfully send the pair off to spend the next two months hunting, feasting, and having sex in the countryside. Upon return, this rite of passage ended with the newly minted adult receiving a military outfit and a drinking cup, signifying his equality with men and difference from women and children. You had to get with a guy to be a guy. Zeus was not the only god to be madly smitten by a male mortal. His brother Poseidon, the god of the sea, was overwhelmed with desire for Pelops. The poet Pindar addresses the beloved mortal. Your father Tantalus had invited the gods to banquet in his beloved Sipulus, providing a stately feast in, in return for the feast they had given him. It was then Poseidon seized you, overwhelmed in his mind with desire, and swept you on golden mares to Zeus's glorious palace on Olympus, where at another time Ganymede came also for the same passion in Zeus." End quote. 
After his expulsion from Olympus, his father bootlegged the immortality nectar of the gods, Pelops tried to win the daughter of the king of Elis, who had challenged every previous suitor to a chariot race and promptly killed each after their loss. Pelops called in a favor to his former lover Poseidon, who granted him victory with a golden chariot and winged horses. Peloponnesus, the large southern peninsula of Greece, derives its name from this Pelops. Certainly, anyone can write a story. However, the origins of the poem give insight into the whole of Greek culture, rather than just the imagination of a single writer. The poem was commissioned by Hieron I, tyrant of Syracuse, to celebrate his Olympic horse race victory, a sporting event from which women were barred. We can conclude it was no insult to be compared to the male lover of a god. It was an honor. The macho all-male set encouraged same-sex sex in those days. The Iliad also mentions a pair of close warriors, Achilles and Patroclus. When told of the demise of Patroclus, quote, by far the dearest to him of all of his comrades, end quote, quote, a dark cloud of grief fell upon Achilles as he listened. He filled both hands with dust from off the ground and poured it over his head, disfiguring his comely face and letting the refuse settle over his shirt so fair and new. He flung himself down all huge and hugely at full length and tore his hair with his hands, end quote. Achilles is so heartbroken that he vows revenge on Patroclus' killer, Hector, even so knowing that his own death is prophesied to follow soon after Hector's. Quote, I will pursue Hector who has slain him whom I loved so dearly, and will abide my doom when it may please Zeus and the other gods to send it. Even Hercules, the best beloved of Zeus, even he could not escape the hand of death, but fate and Hera's fierce anger laid him low, as I too shall lie when I am dead, if a like doom awaits me. End quote. While Homer is not sexually explicit about the two, only pudding-headed Puritans could conceive otherwise. As Eskenes believed 23 centuries ago, their extraordinary degree of goodwill towards one another would be self-explanatory. End quote. Indeed, the contemporary Greek debate about the sexuality of the two focused on just how the pair confirmed to the age-structured ideal of Greek relationships, not whether or not any sexuality was implied. Aeschylus argues Achilles was the older one. Phaedrus in Plato's Symposium calls this nonsense, as Achilles was more beautiful, had not yet grown a beard, and was chronologically younger. Homer, in his sequel, The Odyssey, is explicit about another male couple. He has a married Nestor, encouraging a younger Telemachus to sleep with the former son, Pistratatus, despite that both of them later marry women. Such fluidity was the mundane norm, not the exception. In Xenophon's Symposium, Socrates and his friends are invited to a dinner to discuss the nature of love. He concludes that, quote, Achilles is depicted by Homer gloriously avenging the dead Patroclus, not because he was his favorite boy, but because he was his companion, end quote, reasoning that one, quote, should consider the love of the soul more important than the intimacy with the body, end quote, creating a dichotomy between love and lust, not a refutation of the sexual relationship between warriors. The rest of that very dialogue shows that the Greeks took same-sex sex between men as an obvious given. For example, Critobulus starts the initial conversation by answering that he takes greatest pride in his looks and that he lusts after a male, Clinius, with more pleasure than I watch all other beautiful things in the world, end quote. However, Critobulus had recently married a woman. He furthermore creates equivalence between liking boys and girls when he boasts to Socrates that he could, quote, persuade this boy and this girl to kiss me sooner than you could, Socrates, even if you were to give a very long and clever speech, end quote. For Xenophon, then, it's not that Achilles and Patroclus could not have loved one another, but that as idealized mythical heroes, they should be understood as having the self-control to not act on such carnal same-sex temptations, temptations that were taken for granted. We can surmise as much from when Socrates compliments Callias that he finally managed to fall in love with the male Autolycus, 
a fact that the whole city knows, who wasn't weakened by softness, but rather had strength, endurance, courage, and temperance. You can like men as long it is as long as it is for more than sex, according to Xenophon. Roman emperors. Whatever the exact nature of the Achilles, Patroclus, and the gods, we don't have to settle for fiction to understand a different culture. The first 20 Roman emperors provide possibly the most concise indictment against the quaint Western folk belief in the exclusive heterosexuality of the vast majority of males. Of these 20 leaders, 18 are recorded to have had male interests on the side or outright lovers, one of whom was deified after the death. That's 90%. Julius Caesar, and being, dispatched, quote, and being dispatched into Bithynia to bring thence a fleet, he loitered so long at the court of Nicomedes as to give occasion to reports of a criminal intercourse between him and that prince, which received additional credit from his hasty return to Bithynia under the pretext of recovering a debt due to a freedman his client. The only stain upon his chastity was having cohabited with Nicomedes, and that indeed stuck to him all the days of his life and exposed him to much bitter raillery. I will not dwell upon these well-known verses of Calvus Lucinius. Quote, Whatever Bithynia and her lord possessed, her lord who Caesar in his lust caressed, end quote. He entrusted the command of three legions, which he left at Alexandria, to an old catamite of his, the son of his freedman Rufinius. End quote. Augustus. In his early youth, various aspersions of an infamous character were heaped upon him. Sextus Pompey reproached him with, an eff- uh, with being an effeminate fellow, and Mark Anthony with earning his adoption from his uncle Julius Caesar by prostitution. Lucini, uh, Lucius Anthony, likewise Mark's brother, charges him with pollution by Caesar, and that for a gratification of 300,000 uh, sesterces uh, he had submitted to Alice Hirtius in the same way in Spain, adding that he used to singe his legs with burnt nutshells to make the hair become softer. Tiberius, in his retreat at Capri, he also contrived an apartment containing couches and adapted to the secret practice of abominable lewdness, where he entertained companies of girls and catamites and assembled from all quarters inventors of unnatural copulations. He likewise contrived recesses in woods and groves for the gratification of lust, where young persons of both sexes were prostituted themselves in caves and hollow rocks in the disguise of little pans and nymphs. It is also reported that during a sacrifice he was so captivated with the form of a youth who held a censer that before the religious rites were all over, he took him aside and abused him. Caligula. He never had the least regard either to the chastity of his own person or that of others. He is said to have been inflamed with an unnatural passion for Marcus Lepidus Minster, or Menester, an actor in pantomimes, and for certain hostages, and to have engaged with them in the practice of mutual pollution. Valerius Catullus, a young man of a consular family, bawled aloud in public that he had been exhausted by him in that abominable act, besides his insects with his sisters, end quote. Claudius, uh, this is just a comment, in brackets, we find in Edward Gibbon's 18th century History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, on page 38, footnote W, quote, Yet we may remark that of the first 15 emperors, Claudius was the only one whose taste in love was entirely correct, end quote. Nero, besides the abuse of freeborn lads, he gelded the boy Sporus and endeavored to transform him into a woman. He even went so far as to marry him with all the usual formalities of marriage, settlement, the rose-colored nuptial veil, and a numerous company at the wedding. When the ceremony was over, he had him conducted like a bride to his own house and treated him as his wife. He prostituted his own chastity to such a degree that after he had defiled every part of his person with some unnatural pollution, he at last invented an extraordinary kind of diversion. Which was, which was to he let out of a den in the arena covered with the skin of a wild beast, and then assail with violence the private parts of both men and women while they were bound to stakes. 
After he had ventured his furious passion upon them, he finished the play in the embraces of his freedman, Doryphorus, to whom he was married in the same way that Sporus had been married to himself, imitating the cries and shrieks of young virgins when they were ravished. I have been informed from numerous sources that he firmly believed no man in the world to be chaste or any part of his person undefiled, but that most men concealed that vice and were cunning enough to keep it secret." End quote. Galba. In his lust he was more inclined to the male sex, and such of them too as were old. It is said of him that in Spain, when Isilus, an old catamite of his, brought him the news of Nero's death, he not only kissed him lovingly before co company, but begged him to remove all impediments, and he took him aside into a private apartment." End quote. Otho, after he got into Nero's good graces, he soon became one of the principal favorites, and by congeniality of his disposition to that of the emperor, or, as some say, by the reciprocal practice of mutual pollution. End quote. Vitellius, he spent his youth among the catamites of Tiberius at Capri, was himself constantly stigmatized with the name Spintria, and was supposed to have been the occasion of his father's advancement by consenting to gratify the emperor's unnatural lust. In the, subsequ in the subsequent part of his life, being still most scandalously vicious, he rose to great favor at the court, being upon a very intimate footing with Caligula because of his fondness for chariot driving and with Claudius for his love of gaming. But he was in a still higher degree acceptable to Nero as, as well on the same accounts as for a particular service which he rendered to him." End quote. Vespasian. Uh, this is another comment. Vespasian is mentioned as desirous to gain by all possible means the good graces of Caligula, but this is too vague to count. Otherwise, otherwise the count would be 19 out of 20, or 95 percent. End quote. Titius, or Titus. Besides his, gru besides his cruelty, he lay under the suspicion of giving way to habits of luxury, as he often prolonged his revels till midnight with the most riotous of his acquaintance. Nor was he unsuspected of lewdness on account of swarms of catamites and eunuchs about him and his well-known attachment." End quote. Domitian. He is said to have spent the time of his youth in so much wanton infamy that he had not one piece of plate belonging to him, and it is well known that Clodius Polio, a man of Praetorian rank against whom there is a poem of Nero's extent entitled Lucio, kept a note in his handwriting which he sometimes produced in which Domitian made an assignment, assignation with him for the foulest purposes. Nerva. Some likewise have said that he, Domitian, prostituted himself to Nerva, who succeeded him. End quote. Trajan, I, knew, I know, of course, that he was devoted to boys and to wine, but if he had ever committed or endured any base or wicked deed as the result of this, he would have incurred censure. As it was, however, he drank all the wine he wanted, yet remained sober, and in his relation with boys he harmed no one. End quote. Hadrian, during a journey on the Nile, he lost Antonius, Antinius, his favorite, and for this youth he wept like a woman. Concerning this incident, where uh, there are varying rumors, for some claim that he had devoted himself to, de to death for Hadrian, and others what both his beauty and Hadrian's sensuality suggest. But however this may be, the Greeks deified him at Hadrian's request and declared that oracles were given through his agency, but these, it is commonly asserted, were composed by Hadrian himself." End quote. Antoninus Pius, quote, In my father, Antoninus Pius, I observed mildness of temper, unchangeable resolution in the things which he had determined after due deliberation, and no vainglory in those things which men call honors, and a love of labor and perseverance, and a readiness to listen to those who had anything to propose for the common weal and undeviating firmness in giving to every man according to his uh, desert, uh, deserts and a knowledge derived from experience of the occasions for vigorous action and for remission. And I observed that he had overcome all passion for boys." End quote. Marcus Aurelius, uh, in his teens to his tutor Fronto, 
He wrote, quote, Go on, threaten me with hosts of arguments, yet shall you never drive your lover, I mean me, away, nor shall I the less assert that I love Fronto, or love him the less, because you prove with reason so various and so vehement that those who are less in love must be more helped and indulge. So passionately by Hercules am I in love with you, nor am I frightened off by the law you laid down. And even if you shew yourself more forward and facile to others who are non-lovers, yet will I love you while I have life and health." End quote. In his fifties, he wrote, quote, I thank the gods that I never touched either Benedicta or Theodotus, and that after having fallen into amatory passions, I was cured." End quote. Lucius Verus, when he set out for Syria, however, his name was smirched not only by the license of an unbridled life, but also by adulteries and by love affairs with young men. End quote. Commodus. Commodus lived riding in the palace amid banquets and in baths, along with 300 concubines gathered together for their beauty and chosen from both matrons and harlots, and with minions also 300 in number, with whom he had collected by force and by purchase indiscriminately from the common people and the nobles solely on the basis of bodily beauty. Pertinax. He held ale of Commodus's belongings, even ordering the sale of all of his youths and concubines, except those who had apparently been brought to the palace by force. Of those whom he ordered sold, however, many were soon brought back to his service and ministered to the pleasures of the old man. While lending support to the overwhelming sexual difference from today, the history still sound rather homophobic. Why? First, the English translator superimposed their historical Victorian morality on the ancient past. These translations and contemporary medical books dating from the uh, late 19th century either bodlerized out the naughty parts brought to you by the letter X, or leave them in the original Latin to prevent the pious reader from contracting the vapors bibliologically. Second, the cause of the negativity was not homophobia, as the Romans lacked a concept of homosexuality, and without it, homophobia cannot exist. What some busybody Romans objected to was what they considered feminine behavior. They objected to men taking it up the ass and sucking dick, not because they were homophobic, but because they were misogynistic. A man should not submit to another man like a lowly woman. Obviously, those who partook must have disagreed with such sexual mores. Notice, then, that Augustus is accosted for submitting to his predecessor Julius Caesar, but Julius Caesar is not accosted for fucking Augustus. Likewise, the only stain on Caesar was his early relationship with Nicomedes, not his later relationship with a younger man. The restrictions on submission applied only to free men and not slaves or foreigners, relationships in which neither men would be negatively judged. Nero's crime was the abuse of freeborn lads. A Stoic trend also called for moderation, hence the negative tone concerning orgies and throngs of prostitutes. But such denunciations provide evidence of sexual flexibility. It is assumed without hesitation or comment that the emperors enjoyed both men and women. The outrage is often directed at the number of partners, not their genitalia. Underscoring that point is the commentary on Vespasian. Despite not divulging any same-sex partners for this emperor, Svetonius viewed negatively his insatiable whoremongering of the opposite sex. Similarly, Trajan's love of wine and boys does not arouse rebuke from Dio. Rather, the omnipotent emperor's moderation shows his good character, or a strong liver and cock. It is with these men of power we close this introduction, neither providing an exhaustive review nor a model to slavishly emulate. We are not reenactors. I do not want slaves or emperors. However, the contrast could not be more clear between their past and our sexually inflexible present the false homosexual-heterosexual dichotomy included. This jarring contrast between then and now illustrates that the love between men was not just merely tolerated, but so surprisingly common, leading one modern scholar to, uh, one modern scholar to conclude that, quote, 
It would be a monumental task indeed to enumerate all the ancient documents in which the alternative boy or woman occurs with per perfect nonchalance in an erotic context as if the two were functionally interchangeable. End quote. They seem so different from us, but they are us. They share our genes, and in many cases we have actual Roman or Greek ancestors. The only tangible difference between the Romans, Greeks, and us is culture. Culture does not cause men to like women, a biological inevitability for most males. However, culture must cause the majority of men to not like other men and to only and exclusively like women. These men married women and sometimes other men. They certainly like women, but it's undeniable that they also liked men. Despite giving a somewhat muddled history lesson on the origins of our sexual orientation system, actor James Franco correctly notes that our current system precludes the sort of sexuality we saw with the Greeks and Romans. Quote, because of those current labels, you do it once and you're gay, so you get fewer guys who are kind of in the middle zone, end quote. As the Romans did not have our genital-based classification system for sexuality, they did not have to worry about straying from the good label heterosexual by refusing to engage in what today we would call homosexual acts. He continues, quote, It sounds as though I'm advocating for an ambiguous zone or something. But I'm just interested in the way perception changes behavior, end quote. It sounds like Grero. While most men do like women, our current culture prohibits them from acting on, or in most cases even consciously realizing, their innate attraction to other men because of our erotic gatekeeper, the fascist heterosexual orthodoxy. In the absence of Judeo-Christian culture, masculine likes masculine, or Grero for short. Another way of looking at it would be to compare the sexuality of then and now using the modern standard of the Kinsey scale. The Kinsey scale gives the average of the total of heterosexual and homosexual relationships from a scale of 0 to 6. If you mostly have sex, have male sexual partners, but also some women, you'd be a 4 or 5. If we plot all men on the scale, we would get something like the figure below. Most men in the modern West allege themselves to be zeros or exclusively heterosexual. However, based on this chapter, it's safe to assume that most men in the Greco-Roman world would not be exclusively heterosexual, but somewhere in James Franco's middle zone. This conclusion that our current culture retards an innate sexual flexibility as seen in the Greco-Roman world raises more questions than it answers. What about gays incessantly droning on about being born that way? Surely they weren't made, they weren't made gay by culture. What about straight men who insist that they only like women? Surely they're not lying. We have to untangle quite a bit of gobbledygook to answer these questions.